Hello and welcome back to Click Wars. Jamie, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Good, good. We've spoken with the legendary host of the Niche Pursuits podcast, Jared Bellman. Talked about, well, we can let the cat out of the bag now with his new agency, Big Star, Rockstar Client, and how they're helping them content optimize the whole lot. Um, a lot of content optimization, a lot of like business processes about like optimizing at scale as well. So that was an interesting one. I think everyone mm. will tell you that like, the first thing that they like will ask is like, how are you managing teams to put out like high quality content at scale? And it's like the number one thing. And so any insights into that is always cool to talk about systems, managing that scale, because it's easy for us to, you know, put a whole day into something and make it good. But how do you make sure that everyone underneath you is putting their day in something and making something equally as good? So how do you manage that? And so that was interesting, as well as uh, the business side and everything else. So yeah, really cool episode. Yeah, loved it, man. What a great chat with the legendary JB. Always nice to have him on uh, and chat to him. I think we've both been on Niche Pursuits. So, and uh, yeah, he's just a G, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's get him on. <laughs> oh, let's get into Click Wars. Welcome to another episode of the Click Wars podcast. We are podcast newbies and we come with us in our presence now, a podcast veteran, host of the the biggest podcast in the space, I think by some margin, the Niche Pursuits podcast. Well known. Actually, now why am I introducing you? Jared, gun to head, 20 seconds. You've got 20 seconds to tell your story. Go. I'm always the one giving the introductions, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. The uh, the hottest new podcast in town here. Excited to be joining you guys. Um. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jared Bauman. I, I, uh, I, I'm the uh, CEO of 201 Creative, which is a digital marketing agency that focuses and specializes in SEO work for clients, uh, local, national, um, international. Uh, I am the host of the Niche Pursuits podcast. I've been doing that for a couple of years, which is uh, really fun and exciting. Um, and then spend a bunch of time trying out new things, new side hustles, and kind of sharing what's going on in the SEO world or my world over at weekendgrowth.com. Nice, nice. And you're also going to make a journey over to the UK next May for affiliate gathering. So I look forward to meeting you in real life after talking over podcasts and online and stuff. And so that would be good to see you when you come over as well. I booked my plane tickets uh, over the weekend. So it's official. Can't back out now. I'm on my way. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? You know, I have an idea in mind that I really I'm exploring a lot of right now. It has to do with a lot of helpful content uh, update stuff and a lot of the stuff we've been learning at our agency and seeing because we have access to a lot of client websites. But then a lot of people in the content space, we're seeing such different things out of how their websites are performing. So I have this idea. I'm not ready to share it yet, but I I I. I, I, I want to go a new direction if I can, because I've, I've talked about deleting content a lot. I've talked about side hustle stuff a lot. So we'll see what Carl and the team want me to do. But I'm trying to get my my gears together and, and come up with a topic that's really I'm seeing a lot of interest in myself and to talk about. So it's such a great event, man. So, um, yeah, even so, like, I'm sure even the speakers I came away saying that they learned a lot last year. Um, so props to Kyle and. I'm sure it's only going to get better this year. New new venue as well, interestingly, I saw. So, um, yeah, oh, great. If you're, yeah, it will give Carl a bit of props. Yeah, if you've not if you've not gone to affiliate gathering before, definitely chop along this year. The drinking's great after and the partying um, <laughs> is a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> I I heard you. Uh, I think you you shared it over email or maybe somewhere that uh, that uh, you were you were next year. You're going to do the talk first and the drinking second. <laughs> well i'm not speaking this time but i oh I'm even better like, then well, you can a, just do the a, drinking i know it's great i don't have to worry about the actual like the hard part the labor of it i can just you, uh turn up <laughs> yeah you really solved that problem you're right just cut the talk out you're good <laughs> <laughs> well i had an event before so i had this little free event that people would come to to meet me and i turned up and whatever we got uh, and then WP uh, Alex WP Eagle on YouTube had his event after, and it was big event. All this stuff got that absolutely, was so cool. I got so drunk, I blacked out at the end. I wake <laughs> up, I forget to put my phone alarm on. Remember, I'm on the uh, area was first at nine o'clock, and I'm at like nine thirty. And I usually wake up like nine thirty, so like without an alarm clock, I'm missing it. Somehow, 
And I'm not like a religious man, but the light shone upon me and I woke up without any alarm clock at 8.15, threw up, got ready, talk done, smashed it, best talk ever. Now I can just enjoy the rest of the day. I won affiliate gathering and then blacked out the night after as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping to, to have a slightly different experience, but equally as good. <laughs> <laughs> we had to put Jamie in a cab a couple of times. Uh, it, 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 uh, but to be fair, this was at like 2 a.m. in the one of the worst nightclubs slash the best nightclubs that we've ever all been in. Yeah, the best slash worst. Like, however you want to take that, Jared, or we'll, we'll leave that one. We'll leave that one there. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have visions of uh, Doc Brown in one of those Back to the Future movies where they had to get him <laughs> resuscitated so he could perform. <laughs> It's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He he made it, but he absolutely smashed his talk. He yeah. was incredible. So yeah, prop, props yeah. to Jay. There we go. Anyway, so uh, I think the main thing that we want to talk about is that though you're quite low key about it, you've had great success both on your own projects and as an agency founder helping other people for it as well. And I don't know if this is going to be the first reveal, like where you've talked about it in person, but a real grand, a groundbreaking deal. And I want to talk about it because of the complexity. And I know that I could not manage something like this because publishing is one thing, optimizing is a completely different beast. And so one of the biggest, most well-known people with one of the biggest sites in the space, John Dykstra, who runs the Fat Stacks blog and his own huge portfolio. We had him as the, the sort of launch episode and he's always so insightful. Um, why don't you take it away and tell us, tell us what you, what, what you can announce? Oh, yeah. Well, I think John shared a couple of weeks ago um, that, uh, yeah, we, we recently started helping him out with, you know, uh, actually not with Fat Stacks blog, but his, uh, you know, his portfolio of, of sites and one, his big one in particular, and uh, just focusing on content optimization, you know, and, and I think that it's interesting because we started doing this process before a lot of these core updates and helpful content updates started rolling out. And we saw the value of updating content and doing it in a really detailed way. We saw that come out probably more than ever in these most recent updates. You know, certainly like the helpful content update in particular really drilled in on, hey, is your content super unique? Is it super helpful? Is it, is it something different, right? Like, are you offering value on the internet that no one else is offering? Like if you're just kind of a, a regurgitation of what is already ranking, like we saw that just Google's kind of getting, I'll say a little frustrated by that, right? So, um, but yeah, John, a little ahead of his time, we, we started working together on content updating. We actually updated our entire process for updating content as an agency this summer. Um, the SOP, just to give you an idea, uh, I don't put together SOPs, by the way. Caitlin, my business partner, does. But our SOP for content updating, I think is, I think at last I counted, is at 65 pages um, for our <laughs> team to follow. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we brought in like several, uh, which is what we do. Typically, when we go through an update stuff, we bring in experts. We brought in people like Tony Hill, who's kind of known for updating content at scale. We brought in a couple others yeah. and had them consult for us. We brought in all the things we'd already been doing and already seen that were to work well because we wanted to make it basically like the best, most intricate updating process possible. And then it's almost funny because two months later, helpful content update rolls out and kind of validates a lot of the stuff that we were already trying to do, you know, like bringing in expert quotes from the outside, sentiment analysis, um, information gain, like these are topics that we cover and we address in our updating content. So it's been a fun project. John, John is a big site, you know, so we had to do a, a site audit and content plan. He's kind of shared it over his emails without naming our agency, like all the stuff we were kind of uncovering and helping him work through and stuff and then getting into rolling up our sleeves and just updating a lot of content. So um, yeah, he's, he's a great project and a great person to work with. Obviously, it's, it's interesting as an agency owner to be working with him because he's someone you look up to in our space. And yet, you know, it's our job to perform um, on his site. So it's, it's been great working with him. How I think that's testament like to um, like your, your rise as an agency really though, Jared. Um, you know, you, you're not going to pick up that, that kind of business if you're uh, if you're not doing things in the right way. So, um, you know, congrats. I think it's a, you know, it's brilliant to be working with, with someone like that in the space for sure. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it was, it was really vo great vote of confidence, you know? Yeah. How does a deal of that size come about? Like, do you have to pitch versus other agencies or do, is it just cause you, you know, John and your, he, he respects like what you, and, and knows what you're about. Like, how does that, how does that come about? So we've never advertised ever as an agency. Um, I've never, pitched or, you know, 
uh, we've done a little cold outreach to see if it would work. And, um, you know, I, I'm not saying cold outreach doesn't work, but we were like, oh, let's give it a shot. But after a little while, we we're like, hey, what we're doing is working. Like, let's just pour more gas on that fire. Um, so I don't want to say we've never done it, but I mean, all of our clients have come from referrals, word of mouth. And so mm. um, John and I've known each other for a couple of years now. I mean, I interviewed him on the podcast probably last year. Um, he's been on the Niche Pursuits podcast a couple of times, but I interviewed him last year. One of the more popular ones, of course, because John just gives so much value every time he comes on um, a podcast. And uh, so we had a relationship, but it didn't come out of that. It came out of um, a couple of people who were close to him in his circle saying, hey, you know, Jared's doing some cool stuff right up your alley, like right up what I think your site needs. You ought to reach out to him. And so it's back to that personal referral, even though we had uh, a relationship established, um, someone who had worked with us referred us to him. And so, so the game goes. Yeah. I've That's never so been able to, uh, I've never been able to scale content optimization. Well, I've always hit a wall in that it's, there's such a refined nuance per article in it's so easy to make it worse rather than better if yeah. you don't know exactly what you're looking for, which is why it's so easy to be a content agency and just write new articles. But optimization is a different beast. And so I'm so interested in this topic because no one really offers it as a productized service. And you never really hear about big contracts to do this stuff because, well, it's, it, it, it would have to be so much more expensive because it's so much more refined. How do you train someone, and you mentioned getting experts in, and you have your SOPs, but how do you merge expertise, SEO feel to be able to know that you're not removing the important stuff and uh, or adding too much stuff and making it less concise and losing momentum to be able to do that with that sort of perfect meeting in the middle point? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head because... Writing new content is so much easier. And the reason it's so much easier is because the process is a lot easier to follow. It's a lot more established and it can be done by fewer people. Um, I should pull it up while we're talking. See if I can pull it up here on my laptop while we're talking. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there's between eight or 10 different people that are involved at our agency when we update content. And the conveyor belt, like when you're an agency, you're, you're all about conveyor belts, right? Like we produce a lot of content. We, we build links. We, we update a lot of content. Like, and we do all this stuff at scale. And so it's all about refining that conveyor belt. You know, I actually just talked about it at the Niche Site Summit um, a little while back about how the, the, basic to, the basics to scaling are nail your process, get it perfect. And then at that point, you can start building an assembly line in terms of the SOP that you have, the standard operating procedure. But if you don't have that process nailed down really well, then it doesn't work, right? Because you can't actually build out an assembly line from it. So I think, number one, content updating is very difficult for people to scale because they don't define that process very well. They look at a post and they go, oh, it needs um, A, B, D, Q, and Z. And then they look at the next post and they're like, oh, but in this one, I need to do C, F, G, and R. And... But wait, what is R? Is R actually S? I don't. And so you kind of just start to get into this. I know this because that's what I do. Like when I just pop in on a Saturday morning to update one of my articles and I'm like, oh, cool. And I just start doing stuff. And um, you, so you need to systematize it. I think that's really the beginnings of it. And that's why there's a 65 page SOP is because it's systematized. But once you get it systematized, it's just like publishing new content. It's just got a few more, a few more stops on the conveyor belt, if you will. But how do you make it so like for me, I've struggled with keeping SOPs so that it's so easy that anyone could just be plugged in and do it, but also like, uh, which requires meticulousness, but also understanding people's attention spans and propensity to take on that new information to apply it. How do you balance that? Like 65 pages is a lot for someone to, to start afresh and learn. So there's, I think that it's important when you look at your SOPs to also understand the role that the person doing each task has to play. And so we break it into three levels or roles. There's operator, there's decision maker, and then there's expert. And so something like, hey, go through and create a table in the article because updating this content, there's no table. And generally speaking, this content would work well to have a, ta a comparison table to help people understand. That's an operator level person. They can follow a process and they can make that table and they can move on. Then there's things like that decision makers need to be involved in. And decision makers are someone who, you know, you might think of them as like mid-level management, right? Like they have the ability to process information and understand like if A plus B 
I'm pretty sure we should do C, but let me just double check by looking at some things we've done historically on this site. And I'm also going to check in with someone on our SEO team to make sure. And so then, yes, move forward. And so that's where decision makers will come in. It's a, it's not a, like a, a, a necessarily a super high pain role, but we would call it like a management type of decision. Um, an example of that might be like, um, hey, do we need to remove content from this article? Like removing content isn't always something that you do in an update. But in this case, I'm looking at everything we're doing. And I think we actually need to remove a bunch of content and then start adding something, something different. So that would be maybe where a decision maker comes in. And then you have experts. You have experts you need to work with. And I think a lot of people miss this on updating content. And experts are people who are going to add something completely unique of value based on their perspective and their experience. And that's not something that just a general operator can do. It's actually probably not something I can do. Right, like when we're updating content for a client site, I'm not an expert in that space, and so we have to work with experts. It could be the client, or it could be someone we bring in to be an expert in that space. And so, as you're breaking apart your SOP, you also have to start to categorize these things. Like, hey, who can do this? Can just a general operator in our business do this? Can someone who needs to be able to make a decision do this, or do we actually need an expert level person? So, would That's you class so yourself as a decision maker in that role if you were plugging yourself in? Is that the decision maker being the sort of the SEO? make like deciding what elements would other people would need to be plugged in to do it could be a project manager it could be an seo expert it could be um the brand owner themselves yeah all these could be different decision makers depending on what you what you what you're trying to do it could be a content specialist you know it depends on your team and your size of the team you know a lot of people like this would be um synonymous with maybe some single site operators where like you're bringing on people but you're still the brand person, maybe, um, you know, Jamie, like you're, you're building a website and you're not like an expert in the niche. And when I say an expert, like, is there evidential proof in Google's index that you are an expert? Like, so I, I'm not saying that you're, you're not an expert, but maybe you don't, there's not a lot of breadcrumbs of you being an expert. So you bring that expert in, but you're still the one who puts together like maybe the article brief because you're still the one who wants to determine what topics are actually getting covered. And you're the one who as a decision maker can go, you know, no, we're not going to cover that anymore. Even though all the other brands that are near the top have FAQs, I'm not going to do FAQs because I think that information's already been covered or, you know, whatever. That's a decision maker. And then you can hand that off to people, a writer, that's an operator. Uh, a publisher, that's an operator. A researcher, that's an operator. A graphic designer, that's an operator. Yeah, that's mad. That's really good. Okay. That's really good. So you're laying this out really in so that you're almost literally trying to leave no stone unturned and create what you would regard as the world class page level content process. So when that goes back to the client, they're not just only impressed, they're blown away. Um, and so looking at that list, then what is like something that it seems like with every single post you seem to be going in and adding, what's that one nugget that without giving away the 65 steps of the SAOP, what's one nugget someone could take away from today that you're really trying to implement and you sort of hang your hat on? I think the bit, the most challenging thing to implement and the thing that we're implementing the most because we see it the least is what are you bringing to the world that's new, unique and different? We have, for lack of a better term, like we're really good in SEO at following what's working. We're experts at analyzing the results at the top. We're experts at using software, AI, all sorts of tools to break it down to a, a almost semantic level. We're really good at that. But what that's led to is a lot of things that the helpful content update really does seem to be not liking, which is we're saying a lot of the same thing. We're just saying it better, more optimized and a little bit, you know, uh, uh, more, uh, semantically eloquent. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, there's re when you think about it conceptually, it makes sense with, you know, uh, the amount of, uh, when you think about it conceptually in terms of just what the internet wants, like fresh ideas, new expert takes like new things. So we'll, you know, we'll leave that there just in general, like people want to read stuff that's new and cool and, and up to date, not stuff that's kind of just a regurgitation. When you think about Google and the fact uh, that AI has brought a ton of content, the fact that they're, you know, again, we talk about this every week on the news podcast, like they're always in the news for, for antitrust stuff, for AI problems, for trying to figure out how to get AI, SGE, all these things. Like you look at all the challenges they have up, uh, up in front of them. And as site owners, one of the most valuable things we can do and bring it all the way back to stuff that we probably see the least and thus spend the most amount of time on adding is what are you adding as it relates to this query? that hasn't been added before? And how are we doing that in a way that Google can understand and that readers can, can kind of satiate themselves with? 
And how do you bring that? So just to bring it back to the uh, experts, decision makers, sort of uh, way of distributing work to the right person with the right skill set. When you've loaded that up and you're managing this over hundreds of articles, how are you managing and uh, assigning that? Like, so you've got your, I presume you've got your your management project management system. Is it like, um, like each article is a card that has the different elements within the card that then each person knows the roles that they're going to be assigned to, to then put those different bits on the article? Like, how do you manage that at scale? Yeah, we use Asana. Um, uh, we're probably, Caitlin and I talk a lot about how we're probably running up against the edge of that as a project management system. Um, we've grown quite a bit as an agency and we've probably outgrown that a bit. It still works just fine, but it doesn't provide as much like high level overview for like owners like us. So, um, on a task level basis though, it does a great job. You know, we have pre-built Asana templates out. We have a, a structure to how we organize and how we work together as a team when a task comes in. We have a way we handle Asana, a way we assign stuff, a way we communicate stuff in that task. And so it's all very much systematized and broken down, you know, per team member and per role. And, um, you know, I mean, if you want to know like the nuances of SOP at scale, you, you ought to bring Caitlin on. She's a whiz at this. I, I just sit in the meetings and, um, and watch a lot of this stuff play itself out. But um, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to see at scale. Um, and... Yeah, there's a little bit of stuff that's constantly um, needing addressing. Like when you do this at scale, you're, there's always a couple articles or questions or things that are getting tossed around. And that's when you kind of move into a conversational, whether you use Slack or, or Skype or, you know, and then so you can conversationally kind of answer some of these outliers. Uh, but the, the, the project management process, if you get it, again, going back to if you get it nailed down, it handles the 95 to 99% of it. So just talking about this project with John, because it is so, um, <clears throat> it's so big and obviously you contract a lot of your workforce in to, for, to, to, to 201. So you, you're having to expand that reach. How do you protect yourself as an agency there without having like pulling in? Cause you're, got, you're obviously going to have to assign quite a few members of the team to this project because of the size of it. How, how are you, how are you protecting you know, 201 as a business there? Well, I think if I, if I'm understanding your question, um, you know, you've got to have layers of like one of the most important thing, let me tackle it this way. One of the most important things I've learned as being a business owner over 20 plus years is like the idea behind ownership. And I think this is what, um, to some degree, I think Emith revisited touches on, although he doesn't really talk about it this way. Um, and, uh, and so I think it's a bit of a, like a gap or it's a bit of a missing thing to touch on. Like one of the biggest things you bring, whether you're a business owner, a website owner, whatever it is, like you have a sense of ownership. And as you grow, that ownership begins to, 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 uh, to be spread too thin. You can only own so much in a day. <laughs> you know, like there's only so many hours and it's taxing to own something, right? Like even just think outside of work, like think about like, your most important relationships. Like you have a sense of ownership about those much more so than a casual friend you see at the coffee shop or you, you see on your morning drive or something like that. Right. And the, the, one of the most important things you can do as a, as a website owner, as a business owner, as you scale is to understand that ownership has to be given as you grow. And so we, we assign every single account has like an owner, um, a better way to put it as a project manager, but Project management just implies like I'm, I show up and I'm here to manage it. But the reality is, no, you're, you're there at least at 201 Creative. You're there to own that. You're there to own the KPIs. You're there to own the results. You're there to own the pain if something isn't going right. You're there to own it. And you're there to embrace all the little problems that can come up as you do this. And that, I think, protects the interests of the client because – while we don't own the website to the degree the client does, right? Like they're the true owner. We have someone who's been tasked with having ownership of them as a client and treating it like it's their own instead of just project managing it. And so at that point, it's just assembling the right team members, which we have team members for different roles. And, you know, you kind of just go down the grocery store aisle and you're like, okay, I need, you know, I'm going to need two content uh, uh, optimizers. I'm going to need two writers. Do I need a a, a niche expert writer. I do. Oh, that's in the next dial over. Okay. And we'll grab it. We need a graphic designer. Okay. We'll grab that off. And so then we start assembling the pieces from inside our organization for what the project needs. Wow. And, um, I, I, I don't like feel free to say no, uh, 
to answering this one, but there's an interesting concept of, of giving people ownership over different projects. And so they really feel like this is, like you say, not just coming in to execute, but actually executing on their, I, I guess their vision as well. But like, is it just, do you keep people super motivated purely on that cultural ownership or do they have upside in the projects that they work on? Depends on the actual contractual arrangement we have with the client. Um, I would say that's a minor factor though. Um, you know, like, uh, I think the magic at 201, it, which is really weird to talk about. Cause I don't know if there is any magic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> every business says it, <laughs> that's what I mean. Like I've been doing this long enough to be like, let's be clear. The magic is the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> You're here and you get paid and I sure hope it's somewhat fun and in- encouraging and exciting along the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. But we do have the people fruit bowl who, is pretty cool in the corner. But other than that, yeah, just yeah. show me the money, please. Exactly. <laughs> like I, I don't want to be overly altruistic here. Like you know, uh, you know. Um, but we do have people who've been at two hundred one for a long, long time, and we've been around since two thousand nineteen, so four years. And we have a lot of people who've been there four years. <laughs> uh, I got on the yeah. list of people like Jen and Arlene and Alex and Gabe, and like I just rifle through the list of people who have actually been there since the first year of our company. People have been there three years that got hired in 2020 and have been there since then and stuff. Um, I, I think that, you know, I do think there's a thing to giving people ownership. Um, I think there's a thing to making people feel a part of something bigger. That's a, that's a common thread. Like we tackle client problems. And by problems, I, I really should say challenges. Like it's not problems like, oh, we messed up. Like how do we fix it? It's more like, how do we overcome this? Like how do we get them to spot one? How do we get them ahead of their competitors? Like, and we tackle that really as a team. Like we, we get on little sprint calls and we support each other and we bounce each other ide- off, ideas off each other a lot. And I think that there's, for us, people who do digital marketing, there's a, uh, it can be a lonely position, right? And so it can be fun to go work on a team where you're doing the same things, but you're doing it in a collaborative environment. And supporting that collaboration, I think, is really important to keeping people excited and happy and thus continuing to, 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 to work at the agency. Agreed, agreed. And... Uh... I think that's good. And I think that um, uh, even though I, I, I asked a finance related question and my next one is kind of also, but like it, 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 to, the magic is there, but it is the real thing. I think it is like something and people always talk about, yeah, uh, I want to work and obviously I want to make money. But you, whenever you speak to someone who's really engaged with what they do, they always speak about the culture and the team and making progress before they'll ever talk money. And I think that is good when you can create that magic and uh, if I'm ever managing teams like that, I hope to be able to be as good a like leader of them to be able to make sure they feel that way. Um, next question that's also finance related. Though, <laughs> um, how do you price such a wide ranging project that has so much nuance and like different elements to it? Yeah, the hard part of creating a 65 page SOP has pretty much fallen on, on Caitlin and her organization. The tough part about pricing it has fallen on me. And I will, I will, I will tell you that um, it's, it's the most challenging of all. I, I used to speak quite a bit on, on large stages about pricing theory. If you want to really, if you, if you consider yourself to be good with your internet chops, you can find old talks of mine from a long, long time ago on pricing theory and stuff. Nice. nice. Good luck. Um, you're gonna have to scour <laughs> the internet, but, um, I have, I, I, it's, it's, I think it's very important. And I think if, you know, ultimately if you make stuff like if you make complicated things complicated in their pricing, um, not overcomplicated, just taking a complicated process, and not finding a way to ultra simplify it in terms of how a customer can say yes to it, then I think you, you end up shooting yourself in the foot and you, you take what could be a really cool product offering and making it dead on arrival. And this is a complicated process. Um, I mean, we've come up with, we've kind of come up with a flat rate for the content updating process that we charge per article. And then we charge extra if we need to add additional content. And we charge extra if we need to go out and find an expert on your behalf and source them to be a part of the project. Mm. Those are the only two extras we charge for. Everything else, we just ultimately decided that to, in the name of being simpler for people to get on board with, we're going to know that every project you know, is going to have um, bigger wins or smaller wins, but we'll just absorb that internally as an agency and monitor it. And um, you know, usually... With complicated things, it's best to take a simple approach and pay attention to the back end and just make sure, but it usually comes out, all things come out equal in the end. Nice. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how integral you think 
the podcast and the personal brand growth that come from that has been in what in 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 your success and how do you how like how like i, I met spencer for the first time at fincon like just last week and i finally oh, met nice. him in your life it was so good to meet him after yeah well i was talking to him for a bit and he spoke with andrew as well from lasso and um he's such a great guy he, he spoke glowingly of you how, how and he obviously trusted you with uh, and you've and you've gone and run with it and the podcast looks to be more successful than ever than ever how how much do you think the podcast has influenced like lead gen and stuff like that just i'm interested from the personal it's funny because spencer and i talk from time to time about like the fact that there isn't a much direct correlation between the podcast and tool and creative's growth but wow. that we both know 100 that it's a driving factor of 201 creative's growth that's the whole reason I decided, not the whole reason, that's the main reason I decided to start hosting the podcast two and a half years ago. Um, and this is just how I've gone about building businesses. And so this is my third real go around in building a business. And so I was able to approach that podcast concept with a ton of confidence, just knowing that, hey, if I um, show up every day, well, in this case, every week, <laughs> if I show up every week, and I just try to add value um, that I'm going to build relationships. And after building relationships, I'm going to um, be able to grow my business from relationships. And that's the thing. Like you can't really point. No one really kind of comes in to 201 and says, well, I heard you host the podcast. So I want to hire you to do my SEO. It doesn't work that way. Um, and we don't see much correlation to that. But we get so many referrals and our entire business is referral based. And you can just start to unwind the threads enough to see the connection between, um, you know, hopefully over the course of time, building trust with people, hopefully over the course of time. Well, that's not the primary motive showing people that I know what I'm talking about when it comes to high level SEO. And then oftentimes a lot of people, especially when it comes to SEO, they want to go with someone they trust. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I, I might not be, I'm definitely not the smartest SEO in the room. Um, but I do think there's an element of my history, my background, and what I stand for that hopefully does, at least to some people say, but you can walk in and have an honest conversation with me about it. 100%. Yeah. Like, you know, when you're, you, the way I see podcasts, this is something that I personally immediately leverage in a similar way to you, Jared, is that it's a digital handshake with some of the best people in the industry. You're never going to get 45 to an hour with that person sometimes these people are charging five six seven hundred thousands of pounds for that hour's time but you've got that time and you've got them for that moment and they're they're essentially yours and putty in your hands to mold how you want and actually the relationships that you create in that has been for me one of the most profitable bits mm -hmm. about up the gains some of the the um the the deals that we've had come through have come because hey you should speak to sammy because he's got a really cool site or a really cool brand for example and it's that trust factor of being on the internet as well like putting your face up and and being that that face of that brand people immediately gravitate to niche pursuits and then they think of spencer and then they think of you and that's just like kind of a card and cupboard oh he's got an agency that can help me with that too and it just becomes a very quick and easy decision from that point on it, do you do you do you see that too oh 100 percent. i mean um, and, and that's the thing, like, I'll let everyone know, like, if you go back and look, 2021 was not a banner year for our agency. It was a very slow growth year. Um, I started hosting the podcast in the summer of 2021. <laughs> and, and so it's like, it's not the easy way. It's not the quick way, you know? Um, no. But I think, and you have to kind of understand, like, I didn't just pick the I didn't just sit down and come up with like a list of five things, you know, like we often do when we're talking about how to build a brand after the HCU, right? We're like, let's, okay, what are five That's things I can question. do? <laughs> yeah. Podcast and, cool. Like I was a listener of the Niche Pursuits podcast for a decade at that point. And so I also had a history of, I, I grew my last company on the back of creating content. We called it webinars back then. That's how old I am. Um, and They're coming we did. back in fashion now. Oh, they are back in fashion. I'm like, man, it's like my style. Like, look at this. Epaulets, man. <laughs> These have come in and out of fashion like 20 times already, dude. I just <laughs> put it in the back of the if closet. Wait, long wait, enough. Wait, wait for it to come back to the front again, you know? I mean, but, but yeah, I mean, like... You'll be I, out in flares in a minute. <laughs> oh, man. I got, I got my bell bottoms ready for that one to come back, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, like, you know, like, that's how I built a company before. So I... I understood it, but I think at the base of it all, like I had a, I, I have a heart for the Niche Pursuits podcast. It means something to me. 
Um, I heard somebody recently say, like, they commented on a podcast, like, Jared always seems so interested. It's just amazing. He's such a professional at it. I'm like, no, that's not professionalism. I'm actually, my personality and the way I am and the way I am about the podcast is I'm like insanely curious every time I get on an interview. And I, I, I think that all those things come together in the Niche Pursuits podcast being something that both has been successful for the Niche Pursuits brand, which a lot of people were like, mm, Spencer, I don't know about this. You're handing off the podcast. Like, is this going to work okay? And it has been successful. And I think that it's it's been successful for me as well as an agency owner. And I think that a lot of that, yes, it's about treating the podcast as a trust builder, but it's also about showing up with passion and interest and not picking something that, that I wasn't you know, not that passionate or not that interested in. And so I think the two of those combined perhaps give it what we now get to talk about several years later as, as being something that's successful for all parties. 100% man. And it's been mutually beneficial for you and Spencer. Spencer's been able to grow SaaS products that he want, he wanted to go out and do and your agency and yourself and your personal brand has grown with that. So like, you know, probably the best decision you made. Like, but... Yeah, It does. So, it, it, it has come together really well. So it's been, it's been a true gift. I really enjoy it. Um, I don't know how many I am I'm in. I only found out about my hundredth episode because somebody messaged me and told me I somebody counted. But um, hey, we're probably right. approaching two hundred episodes now that I've that I've hosted. It's actually it's absolutely amazing. So it's it's a, it's a real treat. It's a real treat. Nice. So we're gonna go to the HCU uh, and we're gonna ask you the boilerplate question. Uh, <laughs> it's not gonna be quite boilerplate. <laughs> so every you know everyone is talking crazy. Um, I think that it's pretty much a, the most wild thing that I've seen, and I haven't been in the game that long. This is my third year of being a professional um but i'm actively seeing some niches i look in where me and five competitors are there we were all historically you know neck and neck beating each other losing winning drawing whatever everyone's down no one's up everyone is down it's mm -hmm. just who's down the most um an actual favoritism of ecom local businesses um which is exploitable because we can all pretend to be a local business if we want to but uh, what i'm trying to get to is this is everyone's talking crazy about different things we've had various different solutions posited and um some great information as well about like what what actionable things based on correlations and stuff like that but for your own personal projects what are you doing glenn gabe has been talking for a long time about when you get hit by a core update the best approach is to throw the kitchen sink at it, right? And it's this idea of doing everything. And no, you don't have to do everything. But if you want to officially check the box of giving it your best attempt at recovering your site, you do everything you can. That's when you get the big site audit. That's when you actually update every meta description instead of saying, oh, whatever. That's when you actually, and so you do all the things. Now, what's funny is Glenn was talking, uh, historically, he's always referenced that in reference to core updates. But the... The bottom line is with the HCU, figure out the things that Google was looking for, the things that seem to be a part of this update, and then go do all the things. Now, here's the thing, and I just emailed about this recently. Like, it really does appear like more of a report card from school. Um, that's kind of the analogy that I gave. And I've been studying a lot of this mainly because I got to get up and talk about it every week on the podcast. Like, man, I miss the days of a big update coming out, and you're like, I think I'm going to stick my head in the sand for a month and just kind of <laughs> pull my head back up. And I'm like, dang it, I don't get to do that. I got to go up, show up every Friday and actually add value to this industry. <laughs> you know? I haven't been able to do that. As much as some days I'd rather just put my head in the sand and just wait for it to blow, at least the dust to settle. Let, let's put it that way. But so I have found myself involved a lot. And, you know, um, and, and as an agency level, you can't do that either. So <laughs> you can't, clients don't like that. So I couldn't do that anyways. But I, I digress. There are a lot of factors that show because you're seeing that sites that survived the HCU, they didn't do all 28 things right or all 100 things right. Or, and so there is, and you see sites that have been hit by the HCU getting hit 80%. You see sites getting hit 60%. You see sites getting hit only 15 or 20%. Um, granted, there's a lot wrapped up into the niche you're in and how much other sites in your com competition got hit because that's really actually a bigger factor. But the bottom line is it does look a bit like you're studying for a test. And you, when you go into a test, you have been studying the body of work, but you don't know the actual questions that are going to be in the test. You know that they're about this greater subject, which is history or philosophy. Uh, maybe you're even studying Byzantium history, right? But like you don't know the questions on the test yet, but you have been preparing all semester 
for what it is. And you get given the test and you get given the questions and you answer them and you get a score back. And usually it's like an A or a B or a C or a D. And it does appear that that's a much more applicable process that Google is taking with the helpful content classifier. And you're seeing sites like you can get an A in a class and on a test without getting all the questions right, but you get most of them right. And you can get a B. And as a B, you're still passing, right? Like you might not get into Harvard with that or, uh, you know, uh, you know, name it, uh, in, you know, one of the big schools, but you're still going to do very, very well. And by the way, what do we see when we get to college? I was an economics major. Well, there was a lot of grading on a curve. And I think we see that a lot. Like the HCU is being applied differently depending on which niche you're in. And depending on, And so it's complicated, but it's a bit complicated when you're taking like upper division classes at school. And to me, it's like what to do, figure out a list of all the things that you could do, figure out a list of all the things from that that you will do and go do as many of them as you can to make your site much more like what Google is 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 looking for, and and uh, and then save the debates about whether it's right or wrong, or whether we like it or not, for a separate conversation, which we all love to have, me included. <laughs> but in the, the day, none of that matters. We're playing Google's game, and if you want to keep playing Google's game, you got to have a logical approach to it. Go on, Jay. I was I, 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 I was going to go off topic there, so I don't want to. So I'll let you answer the. the uh, keep HCU me one stuff. more, one more on ACE. So, with how destructive it's been for so many sites, uh, do you are you actively building diversification on like some people are going into Pinterest? No, that was my question. <laughs> like so. Uh, <laughs> with HCU, I personally, for me, I think I'm going for the recovery fully all the way, but I'm also wanting to build asset value and re- like build like that higher multiple by having everything be consistent. So SEO traffic isn't such a large percentage that I am beholden to it. Are you? Is that how you're building your sites now? Or have you always done that? What's your current philosophy on that? I've dabbled on my sites and, you know, when it makes sense, I'm like, Ooh, let's do it. So, you know, we have like, um, we have a, uh, one we've had for a while is like in the fashion space, super applicable to Pinterest. Um, my, my, like my personal site that I work on is more DIY. And so it's got it. Like I, um, I, uh, that niche has a YouTube channel for it. It's not me, but it has a YouTube channel, um, and stuff. And so like, that's the way I've gone about it to me. Yes. Yes. To me, the most important, like, I don't want to have like a hot take on it because I think it's complicated and it's nuanced. And anytime you try to break down complicated nuanced, it, it breaks down. You know, it's like all analogies break down at some point. But the most important thing to me that I'm going to be focusing on, if I could just give you like a hot take, a one take, a quick liner is direct traffic, branded mm-hmm. and direct traffic. People typing my brand into Google and direct traffic coming to that page. Um, because I think it encompasses all the things that Google is looking for. You know, it, it kind of is like a catch-all for, I know social media traffic isn't branded traffic, right? But it's bringing outside sources. Branded traffic is sign- synonymous with a brand, which Sammy, Jamie, we've talked a lot about that over the last couple months and stuff. So I think, you know, yes, out- outside traffic sources, I think are really important because they're signifying that you're building a brand elsewhere. But out of all that branded traffic, if I were to boil it down to my big focus, it would be around that concept. Nice. And how are you sculpting that? Well, um, I made a list of 124 <laughs> questions to ask yourself. And I, I published that as a freebie to give away, for, you know, and it's just it's like 124 prompts. And what it is, is, you know, I took a ton of data that we have been starting to process for the podcast to talk about this HCU and started to pull it all together. And so it, it, it comes from like a bunch of data sources on the HCU and tries to pull in perceived factors. And there's like 124 questions you can ask yourself about your website and about your content to see if how it kind of scores there. So that's a great spot to start in terms of, well, how do I go about doing that? But um, uh, social is a big thing. Um, and then, yeah, building out a brand that is being mentioned elsewhere uh, is, 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 is it, like, you know, is, is the concepts I think to think about. And that usually comes back to the question of, well, how do I make a content website be mentioned elsewhere, which yeah. involves undoing the way that you approach your content website. And so what I always like to tell people is like, look at what I've done with weekend growth, which is not widely successful in traffic, by the way, but as a brand, 
makes me a lot of pretty good amount of money every month. That's something I just started six months ago. And it's because I'm doing all the things. I'm coming on your podcast. This probably will have no value in terms of SEO for weekend growth. Um, I don't even know if you have a website for, 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 for your, your podcast, right? And like, I don't know if I'm going to get a backlink from it. I'm doing the things that brands do, not that SEO websites do. And, and so weekend growth gets talked about a lot. And at this point has very little SEO value. And I think long term, I'm taking that mindset that I've taken with weekend growth to my, my websites. Yeah, SEO is not the be all and end all. And that is something that we're very quickly waking up and seeing. And once you take something away from somebody, they're, they realize, oh, okay, well, there are other avenues here. I've just chosen this one source of traffic for my, from, to get my people to where I want to get them to. But you can pivot. And you might have to pivot. And that's just facts these days. Unfortunately, people, when they look at that and they see 124 checklist points, a lot of people are too lazy or do not want to have to go through and do it. And that's just one of the facts that we've got to contend with here. Are you willing to go the extra mile with your content? Are you willing to, to put the, you know, create the videos, do the extra graphics, come up and find a niche experts are you willing to do that and if you're willing to go down that road then you may win may again nothing's guaranteed here you may win long term so that's the bet you've got to make these days um it, the days of you know banging up blog content and, and hoping to rank is is a long gone in my eyes it's a mindset shift I, th I think at the end of the day like you've got to think about your Website is not a website anymore, you know, and there will be people, by the way, that will continue to be able to rank just websites, right? And they'll be able to schema the heck out of it. And they'll be able to build all their proper entities and entity stack in the right way. And they'll be able to get the high, um, the high value links and they'll be able to sculpt topical authority, all that. By the way, I don't think that's gone, but I no, think that I agree. That's not the easier path anymore. <laughs> Yeah. And, yeah. and no, I, I think the easier I, path that, is kind of proper. exactly like it's a mindset change now. And I think that's actually the easier path, you know, mm. um, it yeah. doesn't mean it's easy by the way, but it just means I don't think that that's the more difficult route. Whereas previous to maybe the HCU, it, it probably was the more difficult. We always, we always gave Sammy a hard time. We're like, well, Sammy's really doing it right, man. He's, he's just, he's taking the harder approach. Well, I don't think people would say that now. I think Sammy's doing it the way that you kind of have to do it. Right. <laughs> I think up the gains mm. is a great example of, what used to be the harder approach and now all of a sudden is the approach. <laughs> it's weird though, because that, that for me is just always been the right way because of, a, I came at it from a marketeer's background. If you became at it, if you were trained in marketing, you would think like that. So that's where John from account management, who started a niche site on the weekends and banged up 50 blog articles, who's got hit by the HCU will find that difficult to comprehend because they're not trained in that way. And that's totally fine because at one, it goes back to the Harper thing. You you were you weren't experienced in that world, so how are you going to know? But having the doors and opening up these kind of conversations and having conversations like this allow us to, you know, hopefully help people grow. And we're far from perfect. We're figuring out too as we go along. But oh, we're sharing this. It's it's a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. Certainly, we're all in this together trying to trying to figure out like it's easy to sit here and wax poetical about do all the things and throw the kitchen sink at it but that, that that's a real going back to your original topic we talked about that's a real scale challenge like how do you do all the things and stuff and i think that that's really where the devil's in the details and we've all got to learn how to figure that out because we do need to change into into more you know into more uh, business building uh, brand building whatever it is you want to call it but you can't just wave your magic wand and go, all right, I'll do all the things and just expect to be able to do them all, right? Like John in accounting still has to figure out how to do all that in the time he mm. has, you know? Exactly. And, um, and so that's, I think, those are, I think are the more interesting conversations going forward um, uh, is, is how we do all the things. That's a really good way and a, uh, uh, a point to make to segue into the, the last sort of the only perhaps thing that you might not have been expecting to talk about, but to do all the things and it doesn't scale requires like being as effective as possible. And so recently, like, for example, I'm very grateful for this. You uh, get, you lent me your SOP on turning um, newsletters into blog posts. We've now oh, I since, did? Uh, or Caitlin sent it to me. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Well, great. I forgot. <laughs> So, but, so since then we used some of the elements and we built a Zapier automation that would use certain prompts and go and give us a first draft of a newsletter from scraping the RSS feed of when we publish a new article on our site. 
as an agency owner, there must be so many ways you could automate to improve. And I'm interested in how you're using it and how perhaps niche sites could automate more things to do all of the things more scalably. Here's one thing we're doing. Um, you know, uh, everything we do at our agent, like a lot of people ask us like, Hey, is 201, am I getting AI written content? No, you're not. Um, you know, we don't, we don't do any of that. Um, like everything's getting looked over by a real person who knows what the heck they're doing and all that. But we are doing a lot of AI assisted stuff. <clears throat> and, um, a lot of like, I think AI is fantastic for brainstorming because going back to like being an owner is hard. I think thinking is hard. My at my last business, my my business partner there used to always say, like, thinking is the hardest thing we have to do all day. <laughs> it's really hard. And brainstorming through AI is super great. So um, here's just an idea. Like what I've done is I've um, we did this at an agency. We, we, we do it now with Python scripts and all that kind of stuff. But it starts with the idea of taking the things that we know about the HCU, i.e. my spreadsheet. Just saying now it's it's prompt based. You'd have to turn that into a more definition based. Um, taking that along with a collection of other things that we know, we know that what Google wants with, from their quality rater guidelines, we can analyze results from updates at scale by co um, coalescing PDFs of, um, of data points that various people have shared. Um, uh, we know what the HCU, uh, uh, is generally looking for. And we, we, as an agency, we put all that in and create a repository uh, to train AI on, and then we will take uh, pages of websites and put them in and say, talk to us about what this website, this page is missing. And that becomes the brainstorming base for a lot of our conversations that then turn into content plans for brands. You know, And we do a lot of content plans for brands. We do several per week where we're creating um, a big, long, usually around 30-page document for them that has all sorts of insights into where there's gaps, what their competitors are doing, what they need to be doing topically, keyword wise. We look at all the stuff that they need to delete. Yes, we do recommend deleting stuff. That's a different topic. Um, all the stuff that they need to optimize, um, uh, you know, links and what type of links they need, like all this, but we can ideate and start with what AI can help. And that ideation process getting assisted by AI, but not just asking ChatGPT, hey, what would you do to this website? Like giving it data and information to train it on and then having it feed that back because that's the way we would approach it anyways. S stuff like that can take a lot of the challenging brainstorm work out and then allow you to quickly move into, okay, it's action time. What do we now need to do? Hmm. And so we have and I'm get, we'll put the um link to your um your database of all of the the 100 plus prompts in the description how do you think that the average niche site owner is not doing the things by not putting their best foot forward where whether that's quality wise whether that's not using the right automations to save them time where do you see the biggest holes in people's games on average yeah, I think, um, you know, and Sammy talked about it a bit when he came on the Niche Pursuits podcast. This is one of the things I was intrigued to, to interview him about before we had the HCU. But, um, you know, I think the biggest thing you can do is understand that, every, like, we, we call it a blog post, but really think about, like, an idea. Um, and maybe it comes out of a keyword historically for a niche website owner, right? Like, it starts with a keyword, and that is how to do X. And the secret to me, is coming up with a process to take, and again, I want to go back, like maybe we'll just call it a query. So it's not really an idea, but it's not a keyword, right? To take a query like how to do X and how to come up with a process that maximizes the type of content, the amount of content, and the content places that you can get from that one query. Using And then how do you build the process to maximize how you get that in as short or as little time as possible? Using AI, using uh, tools using techniques. And, and again, this extends to how do I take this query, how to do X and make a video about it and turn that into 25 short form videos, how to take that video and embed it in my blog post, how to make that blog post. And then how does that play into what I send as my email newsletter? And then how does that play into how I, what I put and expounding? Cause we're now at the point where a website is a collection of ideas. And so how are you going to maximize the value of each of those ideas in a way that does all the things that we need to see in a way that doesn't kill you in the process in terms of the time commitment. And that's where, again, going all the way back to our conversation, like you got to have a really good process for it and try to bring in as many tools as possible. Zapier, uh, AI, 
uh, other tools, uh, people, um, and, and try to, it's, it's like a puzzle that needs solving. It's the most intricate puzzle we've ever had in front of us as website builders. Here's a question for you, and it's a hypothetical one, but um, based on like this conversation today and, you know, the wild talk about video, 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 if you had $10,000, let's say, for example, today, what would you do? Would you start a website or a YouTube channel? I'd start a website. You start a website. There's so much more money in it. <laughs> YouTube is amazing. YouTube's still a longer play, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, I absolutely love YouTube, but I think you still have more control over your brand when you're working off of a website than you are for a YouTube channel. It's yours. Yeah. 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 I would probably I, take 10,000 and start think, an email newsletter, by the way, before I started a website yeah, or a brand. Yeah, I was just or about a, to say, you get the newsletter in there and it's different, different kettle of fish. But I think for me, I would have been 100% website 18 months ago. And then now uh, you'd have me, I'd think about it a lot yeah. more than I ever would. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think that's because the the TAM of, of website building has reduced so much and the risk is now enormously bigger than it was perhaps 18 24 months ago so for someone you, new it's difficult to make that decision you probably have uh have a little bit of bias in me because for whatever reason like um you know this year i've really started out the weekend growth like you know and i've talked about that right but there's a website there's a newsletter there's a youtube channel there's you know there's all these facets right not the the area i've been the slowest in and the worst in is the youtube channel because I just find creating video content to be like, I'm on camera all the time. Like I do two to three, four podcasts a week when you get down to it. But video content for YouTube is so difficult for me. And so I feel like I'm very, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not good at it. Let's just, but I don't feel like I'm good at it. I think you're good at it. You're doing really well. You're getting loads of subscribers yeah. and views. I, I, well, I think I just got enough people modest. on my email list that feel, <laughs> feel sorry for me. <laughs> you're humble and no, more I, I think modest it's good. i, I, I it's like good. it I, it's a good channel man it's a good channel i've watched all your videos when you put them up and you know i always think like yeah hey I'm, hopefully i'm contributing to those watch hours to get you over those that four thousand mark i appreciate but, that um, i do yeah we're, we're about halfway there right now so um i just had like a nice. technical glitch i had to figure out and uh um you know and so i think um and i think you know, but to some degree, like practice makes perfect. And I think that's, you hear everybody, I, I interview people all the time and they say like, oh, my first YouTube video was awful and now I'm better at it. And, you know, you guys are, are, are walking the, walking the walk, right? Like you guys are starting this podcast and I, I don't know, I haven't asked you guys privately or on air, like, you know, if you have some motive behind it, but the, the, the point is like, you guys have probably already found your way and gotten better and better, even in the first 10 or 15 episodes, you know? And so for everybody who is, um, who's thinking about how daunting this stuff is like, I've only done, I think I said like 11 YouTube videos. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'm not showing up like I, I recommend people to. And I know that if I did more, they would get easier. Right. And as they got easier, yeah. I'd learn more. And then I'd learn how to expand that more and I'd learn how to do it better and get more out of it and stuff. And so, I, I need to do more of it. That's I need to follow my own my own recipe. You know, like I think by episode twenty, we'll probably have convinced Jamie to buy a ring light. You know, for his uh, his podcast <laughs> interviewing. Who knows? <laughs> that's my um, that's my notes I've got written down on my pad here. Jamie needs to sort lighting out. Yeah, no, get rid of that vacuum cleaner from behind his background. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's give him time though. He's only ten episodes in. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> I feel like it's authentic and it should never change now. <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie just has a bad light. He can't even see you, mate. You're like blending in. <laughs> uh, I couldn't help it. No, but I mean, I think in general, like I appreciate you guys saying it, but it, the, my YouTube channel is a great example of where I'm struggling through it and constantly doing the thing we all have to do in the morning is like remind myself nope i gotta make that i gotta make a video like i gotta make a video like i get um bogged down by the process of it and stuff and um you know but um you know just to kind of wrap all that up like i have a process with weekend growth and maybe people can borrow it like in a the one brand i'm building that's not well not the one but it's the anti-seo focus like i have ideas that i jot down in an evernote doc and I look that over once a week and I create tweets from those ideas. Now, those ideas could be things I'm seeing working at the agency, observations I'm seeing online, cool stories I read, 
other people's stuff, like whatever. I just jot notes down all week. And then at the beginning of the week, I look at last week's notes and I create tweets from it. The tweets that do well turn into email newsletters that I send out once a week from Weekend Growth. The email nice. newsletters that perform well turn into YouTube videos. <laughs> nice. nice. That's a really good idea. And it's just, it's just a process, right? And then now I'm not having to like build a brand. I just have to come up with ideas. And so it breaks it down. And obviously it's more nuanced than that. But conceptually, that's just where it starts. And I'm not also making YouTube videos about dumb ideas I have that actually I thought were really cool, but it turns out nobody cares about, which 99% of my ideas don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I had that soundboard. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I've done it more on like the the website traffic, if something's really performed or something's like gets a significant amount of user engagement, i.e. people stay on page for long. So I know the topic is like quite good. Then I know that's a YouTube video worth making and it's been proved right. Like our highest performing article is our best performing video. Funny that. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it, the, the two are extreme, you know, inextricable. I can never say that word. They are linked. Um, inextricably. In, 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 <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I, a lot of words don't work for me. So it's interesting when you're making a YouTube channel and you're like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you, you take that video that you made and you put it back on that article that's about the same topic. And all of a sudden your time on page doubles and then you yeah. win again. Exactly. And we solidify position one, two or three or go from six to three and suddenly it, it, it all works together. It's a, it's an ecosystem as I, you know, what went on and about on the niche pursuits podcast in detail, it really is. And they all feed into each other. And the more, the more steps and the more things that you can add to pages, video, custom graphics, podcasts, whatever you, that is, it all helps. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know, there, there's been the HC. I, I asked Spencer actually about this on the podcast, on the news podcast we did. By the time this comes out, probably a couple of weeks prior, um, you know, and and he was liking it. He's like, "Hey, I've been around for all the big updates, and this is as big as Panda and as big as Penguin." The difference is that when those updates came out, we knew what it was targeting. With the HCU, we really actually don't know what's targeting. So if you're feeling thrown off, this is the craziest update in the history of Google because it's landscape changing and we know very little in actuality about what it is. They say it's this and then we see all these examples of that and they say it's this and then we see all these. And so it's a very unsettling time. And, but if you're in for it and you're, you know, like Jamie, like you, you're like, I'm here and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it my all to recover. Well then we still have to figure out what it is that we need to do going forward. And even if it is unsettling, but that's why it's great to have these kind of communities where we can get together and talk shop, commiserate a bit. And um, <laughs> I, I hope that, you know, listening to me drone on for an hour has at least helped people kind of get their minds around some of the concepts there, but also just know that to some degree, everything I said, like we don't have a recovery plan. And that's why I tell every client who calls 201 creative and we get a lot of calls about the HCU. And I'm like, Hey, just to be very clear, like, I'm happy to get on a call with you. I'm happy to talk about the best practices that we think as an agency. And by the way, we have a lot of experience, but that we think as an agency will help, but there isn't a recovery plan in place yet. And so to some degree, being a part of these sorts of things is really healthy for us as we develop that recovery plan and, and figure out where we're going forward. Brilliant. Great way to wrap this up. Thank you, Jared. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, so much in there. I, I, I've selfishly learned a lot. And uh, yeah, it was really nice to unpack uh, different sides to, you know, the agency and, and things you, you're doing there. Because um, yeah, hats off to some of the work. And I hope it works out for John. I really do. Because um, yeah. that's a piece of a sight, man. <laughs> but yeah, if you couldn't uh, let everyone know uh, the, the juicy links. Yep. You can find me at 201creative.com if you're interested in the agency. Um, if you're interested in my mostly unsuccessful musings uh, and ideations, that's on Twitter at Jared Bauman. Um, and then, you know, if it does make it to newsletter, you can find that at weekendgrowth.com. Nice, nice. And just to cap it off, um, Jared, it's been wonderful to have you. It was a very insightful one. Um, beyond like just the technical, this is a strategy in SEO. I enjoyed hearing you talk about it in a sort of more like philosophical, like stoic way. And so I think that a lot of people need to hear that. It's a different way of looking at things than most people are. And uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> so I'm sure it's a out? magical conclusion. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I tried to hold it together. I was like, he's being so nice and it just went. <laughs> Should I have another so go wonderful. I'll catch up. I'll catch it on the conclusion when it goes live.
<laughs> okay, okay, okay. We'll call it will it come out. Thank it you so much, come out. It was a really good time to talk. Awesome. And, uh, really thanks for coming on the podcast. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. My pleasure. It's no, great to be here with you guys. It, Jared. Thank you. Thank you.